Now, I would like to call Dr. Anupama Rajesh, ma'am, Head of Internationalization Cell and Professor Amity Business School and her team to introduce our keynote speaker and take over the session. Greetings of the day and Namaskar. We welcome you all to the first session of the Mega International Lecture Series, which is envisioned as a curtain raiser to our annual international conference, which is Global Leadership Research Conference 2022. There will be series of international lectures of academic stalwarts who will share their immeasurable knowledge and acumen, which will enlighten all the present. We are making an auspicious beginning with the world's renowned academic stalwart and Dean of University of Winchester, Professor Dr. Martin Broad. Now, I would like to invite our Honorable Dean of Faculty of Management Studies, Director and Head of Amity Business School, Professor Dr. Sanjeev Bansal, sir, to welcome our esteemed guests with a sapling. Welcome, Professor Broad. Thank you so very much for being there. Thank you, sir. Proceeding further, I request Dr. Anupma Rajesh, the head of internationalization cell and professor at Amity Business School to introduce Professor Broad. It is my absolute pleasure and absolute honor to welcome and introduce Professor Dr. Martin Broad. He is a Dean of Faculty of Business Law and Digital Technologies at the University of Winchester. He is a Chartered Management Accountant with a PhD in the Management Accounting from University of Bath and has held numerous posts at the University of Southampton, including most recently the head of Southampton Business School before being appointed as Faculty Dean in September 2020 at the University of Winchester. He also holds a position of an honorary professorship at our own Amity Business School. Martin is also involved with the Chartered Association of Business Schools, being a formal chair of the International Committee, where he remains as an active member, and also the vice chair of Council of the Chartered ABS. With over 30 years of experience in higher education and a keen research interest in higher education governance and management accounting, he has been the principal investigator on funded research activity with the British Council and the Worldwide University Network, where his research has an international focus. We welcome you, sir, and request you to deliver the keynote address. Thank you very much indeed and a very warm welcome to everybody. Um, it's a fantastic pleasure to be here and for, for all the guests that are listening into um, today's session, it's been quite a 
um, a fraught um, gathering to get here today in terms of the technology working, but like swans on the water, we are smooth, everything is working perfectly um, this afternoon. Uh, so it's a great honour to be with you, um, with Amity, and to present a keynote um, for your esteemed um, um, sessions today. So namaste, uh, and I look forward to, to meeting you all in person soon and um, hopefully addressing some of the, the challenges that I think um, are important in terms of leadership and my own reflections um, for business education. So what I hope to do during the next half an hour or so in terms of my presentation is to work through the slides and the slides are being um, linked um, from, um, from students in Amity. So if I let you know when to progress to the next slide, that would be fantastic. Um, there is an audio clip that I'd like to try to play within the presentation. We'll see if it works. If not, I will see if I can stream it from my side um, through to you and see if the audio will work on that one. So um, it's a really interesting audio clip from the BBC and Radio 4 that gives some insights into robotics and artificial intelligence, but we'll see how that progresses. So welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Professor Martin Broad. As you heard there, I'm the Dean of the faculty here at the University of Winchester and honoured to be an honorary professor of your esteemed university as well and heavily involved with yourselves in the Global Leadership Conference um, and also with today's um, sessions as well. So what I would like to do today is to, to spend a bit of time reflecting on leadership um, and also for business education. And quite a bit of this, this talk today will be some of my own reflections on leadership. It'll be looking at a bit about innovation, It'll also be looking at globalization, and it'll also be picking up on my own personal reflections, what I think is really important for leaders in this global context. So if we move to the next slide, this leadership innovation and um, dynamic. Um, if you could move to the next slide for me, oh, thank you. Um, this innovation leadership dynamic, I think is really important. It's great to be a leader within an organization, but we have to recognize that there are disruptive technologies that are taking place. Those innovations in the workplace, um, the innovations in work generally, the innovations in artificial in intelligence, and the disruptions that we now see across the global spectrum are quite profound. And if we look back to just the pandemic, that was a massive disruption. But coming out of the pandemic, we still have massive disruptions. And we're seeing these massive disruptions in the global supply chain of infrastructure, goods and services throughout the world, um, impacting significantly in the UK, and I'm sure impacting significantly in your country as well. So there are innovations and there are disruptive changes which are causing all sorts of challenges for leadership in this global context, this interconnected global world in which we now operate. And I think that becomes for us the, the crux of the matter, the crux of the problem that we are faced in terms of business education to help prepare students and managers for this agile, dynamic, changing world in which we are very much part of now. Next slide, please. So my questions as we reflect on this aspect of leadership and innovation is thinking about does innovation impact on leadership or does leadership impact on innovation? Can you be a leader without thinking about innovation or do you need to have innovation in your leadership style to be able to cope with the changing dynamic of the global environment in which we now operate? So some big questions here around leadership. What is leadership? And I'll give some of my own personal reflections on that in just a moment. But also, what are the innovations that we see that create the greatest challenges in a global environment now? And I've alluded to the fact that the global supply chain is quite a significant problem um, that we're facing at the moment. So, the other challenges we have, I think, are also in relation to what we can do, and, and the we here are universities. What can we do as a university leader, as a university educator, to help organisations, help you as students, help managers of the future 
um, cope with the changes that are going to be taking place within the, the, within the world and place. So these are some of the big questions I'd like to address and give some of my own personal reflections on those. Next slide, please. So I think it's probably worthwhile just saying what I am not. We heard from the introduction that I've been in the UK higher education system for 30 years. Yes, I have a PhD. I'm a qualified management accountant. But what I am not is I am not a HR manager. I don't have um, a list of professional qualifications around leadership. But what I did find very quickly when I took on one of my first managerial roles as the head of a business school was I needed to become a HR manager. I needed to understand a lot about leadership. And you can read a lot about lead, read leadership. You can read about servant leadership. You can read about compassionate leadership. You can read about uh, responsible leadership. And all these areas of leadership are vitally important. But for me, what I have learned is that a lot of the leadership qualities that people have to become effective leaders, effective managers, are not necessarily what you get taught, but it's part of your being. It's about you as a person. It's about you as an individual, your personality, the way in which you listen, you empathise, you hear what your staff are saying to you, you understand the global challenges, and you have to be dynamic in your own thinking and agile in your own thinking to make sense of that. And sense making in leadership, I think, is so crucially important as well. So as students, as managers, providing executive education, providing the theoretical constructs around leadership, absolutely, we can learn about these leadership traits. Compassionate leadership, really important. Responsible leadership, servant leadership, and we can go on. But I think that to become an effective leader, you need to have those personalities built into you and you then flavour that with your knowledge of the compassion, the responsible, the empathetic leadership that you need. Because leadership is about bringing a team with you. It's not about being the leader and being out there as the sole leader within your organisation. It's about having a team of people who are prepared to follow with you and are prepared to help you deliver the strategic ambitions that you have for your organisation, be that a university or be that a for-profit organisation. So as a leader, I see myself as someone who is the captain of a ship, essentially. A captain of a ship that understands the geography, that understands the uh, the wind, um, the wave height, etc. But I've got a team of people that work with me and um, that are prepared to, to do a lot of the hard work to make the organisation a better place. And I think if you have that buy-in from your team, then it makes the leadership of the organisation so much easier and so much more rewarding because you are able to deliver effectively what you want to achieve for your organisation. Next slide, please. So we're going to focus a little bit on leadership at the moment and I'll then look at innovation and we'll move on to perspectives for business education. So next slide, please. So importantly, if we think about what leadership theory is and leadership practice is, we can think about the knowing of leadership is not the same as becoming. Understanding the theoretical aspects of leadership, being knowledgeable, does not necessarily make you a leader. So knowing is not the same as becoming. To become a leader, you need to, as one of my colleagues would say, you need to, you need to smell, smell what the, the, the environment is like. Take a deep breath, understand what is happening within your organisation, understand what is happening within the external environment in which you're operating. And and internalise that within yourself. My question is, is leadership taught or is it caught? I can bring you on to an executive programme. We can have hours of debate about leadership, debating which is the right effective leadership, 
style? What are you trying to achieve? Are you autocratic? Are you democratic? Are you servant leadership? Do we use agency theory? What theories do we use? Some of it will stick and some of it will stick in your heart. And once something sticks in your heart, then you have become caught as a leader. And that inbuilt personality trait, I think is so vitally important to getting people to believe in you as a leader so they will follow in your footsteps. So there are hundreds of books, scores of scholarly treaties. You can come on seminars, you can come on workshops. We can earn a lot of money from delivering executive education, bring on research as the case may be. Uh, we can spend a lot of time on our search engines, looking through to see what leadership styles are all about. There's no shortage of information out there. Absolutely, there's a huge amount of information. But still, I reflect on the fact that many, many people come to universities to undertake executive education, leadership programmes, undergraduate programmes, postgraduate programmes, to become a leader. Almost like this a view that if I go to Harvard or if I go to Yale or go to the UK or go to Amnesty and do a course on leadership, I am going to become a leader. That's not the case. You will learn about leadership, absolutely, but knowing is not the same as becoming. So there's a lot of, we, we heard from the Vice Chancellor about the case study approach. Vitally important to understand, to have that deep immersion within leadership case studies to understand the dynamic that's been taking place. And you learn so much from understanding the multifaceted approaches and challenges around leadership. One of the, the best leadership case studies I think I ever listened to um, was um, NASA and the Apollo launch that almost ended in complete catastrophe uh, and the death of the various astronauts. It didn't but there were a huge number of leadership learns from that. And if you ever get the opportunity to Im immerse yourself in the NASA case study of one of the Apollo um, flights that had a catastrophic um, failure, but they got the astronauts back to land. It's a fantastic leadership understanding of some things that really do go wrong um, and um, the lack of people taking responsibility for the things that are going wrong. Next slide, please. So if we think about the characteristics of leadership, when considering characteristics of the person associated with leadership, let's focus on the skills, the personality and the leadership style of the individual. And I think that personality is so key. As we've heard various speakers and you'll hear various speakers today, tomorrow and over the global leadership conference, you'll get a sense of their, the way in which they speak, the way in which they pause, they take time to reflect and to listen. And that personality and that leadership style comes from their individual person. We believe that leadership is really concerned with motivating and influencing people with the aim of shaping events. And we can reference the literature around that. So yes, as a leader, we're all in the room today, I think, and we are about motivating people, absolutely. Influencing people with the aim of shaping the events to be able to achieve the objective that we want to achieve. Maybe that improve, an improvement in profitability of our organisation, or it might be in terms of the social justice agenda, sustainability aspects, etc., or things that we want to do. But authenticity is so critical um, through this. If you're not authentic, in terms of what you're trying to achieve for your organization, for your people, then will you get people to, to follow with you in your footsteps? And so I think that before you can lead others, before you can help others, you have to discover yourself. Who are you? Today, I don't think that a leader can simply impose himself or herself on others. I, I can't come into this session today and say, I am an effective um, higher education um, leader. I think I'll point to the history of what I have achieved and what my team has achieved. I always talk about my team, not as me as an individual. There is no I in team. It is a group of people that makes a team. You need to make yourselves 
available to others. I always personally have an open door policy. I want to see my staff. I want my staff to feel as though they can come and approach me. I don't sit in an academic ivory tower or in a locked office away from the people that I, that I manage. I have an open door, a discursive um, element to, to smell the environment, to find out what is happening on the ground. And I think that from all of our upbringing, maybe it's religious or just in terms of your family upbringing, someone who knows who they are, who is authentic, can create trust, um, creates the ability to engage people within the organisation. And it is different in very many different organisations. And I'm sure you could point to successful leaders who are very autocratic, who are very dictatory in terms of their approach. But you can also uh, point to leaders who are very open, welcoming, authentic, empathetic in terms of their approach. And different people buy into these different personality traits. And that's part of the leadership styles that we develop and the way in which we operate then within the organisation um, and hopefully become an effective leader and move our company forward. Next slide, please. So I put out that I think there are a number of atypical characteristics that an, an engaging leader should have, should be authentic. You can believe in the person that you're speaking to and is your manager. Someone who has an integrity, trust, drive. We want to achieve something, um, is enthusiastic, has self-belief and self-awareness around that as well. If you click for me, please, on the next slide. And this creates, I think, an empathetic, confident, believable leader that will get buy-in from people. So from people in the audience um, listening to this, you might be reflecting on your particular characteristics. Do you come across as being an authentic leader? Have you got the drive within yourself to want to make a difference for your organisation? And that drive within yourself helps you bring people with you. I think if you've got that, you've got that glass half full approach to life, um, you're very optimistic, you've got to be believable. You get people joining with you and, and coming on that same journey with you as well. Next slide, please, or click through, please. So there's a little, can you take me back one slide, please? I think that picture is really important. It's quite a funny picture. So there you've got the little child there who's really upset and you've got their, looks like their, their older sibling giving that comforting arm around the shoulder. It's an authentic, it's got integrity. Come on, I'm with you. I want to help. As a leader, if you can bring your team with you in that face of adversity, that sometimes things don't go particularly well, but you can metaphorically put your arm around them and say, come on, together, it's not so bad. We can get through this. We can achieve the things we want to achieve and be positive in that. So I think that that picture just embolishes um, that authentic, comforting leadership approach that I'm referring to here. Next slide, please. So let's pick up on the innovations and the globalizations, then we can try and pin things together in relation to how the, um, this all comes together in terms of helping you become effective leaders in the future. Next slide, please. So what is this thing called innovation? Many students are learning about innovation. Um, we all live with innovation. Is innovation the same as disruptive? technology. I don't know. Innovations can be great, good things. Disruptions create innovation. But I think a lot of the changes that we see within society these days are pretty disruptive, but they are, in most instances, they create positive change. And we've seen massive changes in the, the workforce and in terms of jobs that are available. Is that innovation or is it just change? I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's whatever it is, it's innovation or it's disruptive technology. Next slide, please. And the challenge that therefore we have is with all of this innovation and with all of this disruptive technology, what does the future hold for the jobs as we know it now? What does this mean for leaders of a world in which we simply don't know what this disruptive technology is going to deliver to us? And one of the biggest questions I think we've got to face with ourselves is the challenge around artificial intelligence. And I hope for everybody's sake that artificial intelligence 
does not become intelligent, artificial intelligence. If it does become intelligent to the extent that humans are intelligent, then the computer generation, the machines will rapidly take over our slowness of evolution and humans will almost become redundant. So that puts out some quite difficult challenges in terms of what we expect artificial intelligence to perhaps to deliver for us in the future. Next slide, please. So some of the difficulties we've got is thinking about what jobs exist at the moment that could become automatable and are becoming automatable at the moment. And as an accountant myself, this perhaps worries me the most because a lot of the work that I would have done as an accountant through my formative years can quite easily be done by a computer. A debit equals a credit. The production of financial accounting standards or financial accounting reports, they are rules based. This can be done by looking at the data within a company and producing a statement of accounts, which is pretty um, straightforward if you follow the rules. So if you have a rule based system, then the computer generation, the artificial intelligence can automate a lot of those works for you. One thing that cannot be automated at the moment is the work that requires us to think, that empathy. So I put in there about mental health workers. That's a really difficult, dynamic, subjective, empathetic um, job family that requires you to understand the complexity of the mental or the working mind or the, the, the mind generally and trying to work through some complex issues. So a lot of jobs can have some degree of automation. Some jobs perhaps cannot be automated unless artificial intelligence becomes intelligent artificial intelligence. Next slide. So there are, can you take, take me back one slide, please? Take me back one slide. So there are occupations that can be 100% automated. But thankfully, 100% of those jobs being automated, it's only about 5% of the total job family that can be automated. So imagine, um, imagine Lego, for example. As a child, I used to have Lego. I'm sure you've maybe used and played with Lego in the past. When I used to get my Lego Christmas present, I used to open it up, build my thing that I had to build, and invariably there'd be one piece missing or there'd be something missing and you go, oh gosh, I've got to go down to the shop and buy that extra piece. My children had Lego for Christmas and for birthdays. There was never, never a piece missing. Why? Why? Because a human picked the Lego pieces when I was a child. A computer picked the Lego pieces when my children were children. And so the jobs of picking the yellow Lego brick and the red yellow brick and the, all the other bits were done by a computer. It was weighed, it was checked, it was 100% accurate. The human error was removed. And so that job could effectively be undertaken by a machine to collect the pieces of the Lego, put it into a box and give it to me or my children for Christmas so that we had 100% of the pieces that we needed. But thankfully, not all jobs can be 100% automated. But the challenge then is if 5% of those jobs are automated, then we need to find new jobs to keep people employed. Next slide. So the other challenge then is that so a of some jobs, 100% of that job can be automated. Of other jobs, up to 30% of the job could be automated. And that is a larger percentage of jobs that exist out there in society. So you have to reflect on what jobs that you see now that there has been automation taking place. If we look at the financial services sector, when I was young, I'd go into the bank. I'd go into the bank and there'd be lots of people there doing lots of jobs. When I go into the bank now, there are fewer people there doing fewer jobs. 
And that's because the machines, the computers are taking over a lot of the work, but they haven't taken over everything yet. So there are job families that up to 60% of the jobs that exist could be automated by approximately a third. So if we reflect on this, we've got 5% of jobs that could be 100% automated. We've got a big chunk of jobs, 60% of jobs that exist, that could have around about a third of their, their roles automated. And that is a lot of the workforce. That's a lot of managers that are no longer needed. That's a lot of leaders that are no longer needed because you don't need to lead a computer. You just need to be an IT expert to lead a computer. But we do have jobs that are emerging in the gig economy and other parts of the economy, which require more leaders to come through. Next slide, please. So I'd like to play a little clip from James Burke, who's a science historian, um, that did put out the challenge, the real difficulties that we have around robotics, artificial intelligence. Now, I'm not sure whether this is going to play um, because it requires a login into the UK BBC Radio 4. But could I just ask you to click on the, um, the icon there, the BBC Radio 4 link, and just see if it does play. If it doesn't, we'll see if we can move to plan B and see if I can play it from this side. So there might be a firewall that prevents it going through and we'll see what happens. It says it's loading it's on my screen. Loading there. <laughs> Let's see if it does work. Um, if not, I'll see if I can play it from my side. Okay, can you see, can you play and can you hear? Can you click on the play icon? Yeah. I can't hear anything. Can you hear anything? Could I get a thumbs up if you can hear? I can't hear. I can hear, but I'm not sure if it is audible to the audience. Can the MCs confirm, oh, please? Uh, Shivangi, just play it. As of now, it's, it's paused. Just play it. Okay, ma'am. Owned by computers. Now, the whole idea. Yes, I can hear it. Taking I can hear it. Just take it at the beginning and start again. So please listen very carefully. If you can increase the volume, please do so. It's about a four minute clip, but it's really interesting to hear the change in the way in which robotics could change our life. Okay, to start with, robots doesn't necessarily mean those little Japanese humanoids. Most of the robots will be just machines, appropriately designed for the job they're doing, and controlled by computers. Now, the whole idea of such machines taking our jobs isn't new. This time, it's happening faster and more before. Machines are already writing newspaper articles, defusing bombs, milking cows, driving cars, trading stocks and shares, recognizing this, diagnosing and treating patients, assessing insurance risks, flipping burgers, Marking exams. Any job in some kind of repetitive procedure, like a supermarket checkout. In Seattle, Amazon has just opened a store where you point your smartphone at the goods you want, it reads the barcode and tells your bank to pay. So you just take the stuff, leave. It's called grab and go. Checkouts. In 10 years, most low skilled work will be done by machines. Within 20 years, Middle management will also go once computers learn how to follow the decision processes of lawyers, bureaucrats, accountants, and the like. Machine learning is getting easier as computers get faster and more powerful. Within 20 years, they'll also be the size of a grain of rice and embedded in everything and networked, which will make learning easier for the algorithms. Algorithms are rules for computers. Do this. If it doesn't work, do it. With trillions of network sharing their learning experiences, they'll learn fast. After which, they'll move into upper level jobs, ones that require knowledge and years of experience interacting with clients. IBM's Watson program, which also talks and listens, 
is already doing those things in what used to be called call centers around the world. Call centers. All in all, it's likely that 90% of jobs will be gone within 30 years or so. Unlike previously, even if new technology does create new jobs, machines will do them. The problem then is, without jobs and income, how do we all buy stuff to live? How cheap the machines have made it? The answer looks like universal basic income to everybody. It's about 14,000 a year. But where does that money come from? Or is it just funny money produced to keep the economy moving? And then, what will we all do with nothing to do? Meanwhile, looming over everything, the question of how soon so-called artificial intelligence will supersede us humans entirely. There's perhaps a glimmer of optimism here. Everybody's brain is nearly a hundred billion microscopically small neurons, each neuron sending signals down its maybe 10,000 thread-like extensions called dendrites, each dendrite carrying maybe 10,000 points where the signals arise trigger the release of molecules that cross the gap to some next door dendrite, trigger signal back up to its neuron. That's happening now up to 500 trillion times in your brain. Each time the signals get to each transfer point, the messenger molecules released get modified, according to feedback from everything else happening at that instant, your brain around you. It's the most complex process we know in the universe. And I've got one of these marvels. But even if a computer ever did get big enough to do everything the brain does, would such machine complexity automatically also generate the kind of open-ended self-awareness that makes us sentient and create humans? Some researchers say that will never happen. So if that's true, then maybe for now, loss of jobs is a big enough problem to be worried about. Soon, by the sound of it. Thank you. So, what will we all do if there is nothing to do? If robots take over the world and there is no um, jobs for us and we all have to live off handouts of, of payments and society would be challenged then. Let's not hope it gets to quite that degree of a, of a problem for us in, in society. There's some poignant um, messaging there from, from James Burke. And some of that, that conversation, when he started off there, you think, well, that, that was probably 10 years ago, he said that, surely, because we're seeing now automation in the supermarkets, we're seeing these things happen, and that's just the normal, the normal things that we do. And we reflect then thinking, this, this interview was only two years ago. The rate of change is phenomenal. The challenge for us is creating new jobs to keep us all effectively employed and creating in leaders um, that can deal with these five trillion of decision-making things that are going on in the most complex machine in the, in the universe, which is our brain. Next slide, please. So we talk about the constant is change and the constant change just gets quicker and quicker and quicker. Careers are changing, work-life balances are changing, economies are changing, demographics are changing. The changing workforce is out there. You, as future leaders or current leaders at the moment, need to be dynamic, agile, reactive, responsive, fleet of foot to understand the landscape, the environment, to smell what it's like out there, to be an effective leader for your organisation. Next slide, please. So the big question for us in higher education is if we have all this disruptive technology, if robots are potentially taking over the world, that there are no jobs for us to do, then the big question then is, are business schools fit for the future? What is the point of us as a business school if we don't know what's happening in society because the rate of change is too great? We don't know what jobs are going to exist in the future. So how do we educate and train our future students or provide executive education for future leaders or, or now leaders? How can we do that? And the big question is, how can we as a business school, how can we as education providers 
remain fit for the future. Next slide. So there's about 16,000 business schools in the world. And over the last 60 years, the number of business schools has grown dramatically. And that's according to AACSB, one of the, the global accreditation bodies. So some big, big growth in terms of the business school um, supply in terms of the, the education provision out there. If you can click for me, please. And click for next slide or next section, please. So the challenge for us is that we already recognize that in five years, 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, many of the business schools, they simply can't exist in the current shape and form that they are because the world is changing. The constant is change. That rate of rapidness is getting greater and greater. And so as a business school, we need to be dynamic, fleet of foot, have that drive to think about what we need to help prepare students for, a career that we don't know what it looks like, in a world that we're not quite sure what it could look like, and how do we create the future leaders of this, this world in that um, globalised, innovative space when we're not quite sure what it looks like in the future. And that poses the existential question, I think, for business schools and for us as leaders to create the new leaders of the future. Next slide, please. So do we look like that? Do we look perplexed? Do we look aghast? What are we all about? What are we going to do? What, what's going to happen to these 16,000 business schools? What's going to happen to this huge growth? What's going to happen to us? What, what are we going to do? And this poor young thing here is going to grow up into a world that we need to prepare them for so that they don't live on handouts, so they have a meaning in life and they, they can take advantage of that. Next slide, please. So we recognise that the key global trends are going to be we need to have and any time, any place, anywhere. We've moved away from open 24 seven. That's gone, that's old hat. It's now 60, 60. You know, I'm dealing with WhatsApps coming from Andy Palmer now, you know, in a real time environment coming through. I'm multitasking on WhatsApp, talking to you in India, here in the UK, in a complete different time zones. It's, it is instantaneous. As students of the world today, when you send an email to your tutor, do you expect to reply tomorrow, the next day? No, you expect a reply within minutes. And if we don't send a reply within minutes, it's I get another email or another WhatsApp. Why aren't you replying to me? You know, it's this constant um, pressure on this instant need for consumption rather than the way in which you have worked. And that speed of the way in which businesses work is just phenomenal. So there's disruptive forces on jobs and employment. And there becomes the real issue for you as students and why you need the education, why you need the education from a business school. You do not want to be in the lowest skilled jobs. You do not want to be living off in the States on handouts for because the machines are taken over those jobs. We need people who can be agile, empathetic, who can understand the environment, who can be thought leaders to help businesses take account of all of these things. We've got all sorts of things happening. You've had challenges around demonetization within India. We've got other disruptive forces taking places. This constant change will continue for the future. And how can we help provide an effective um, economy and effective leaders for the future? Next slide, please. So as we move into this changing world, you may think, well, the answer is I'm going to run my own business. I'm going to be a, a, an entrepreneur. And we see a huge amount of this taking place now with entrepreneurial spirit. I see it from the Indian students. I see it from students in the UK. The challenge I put out there is that being an entrepreneur does not equal success. Being an entrepreneur means that you can, you've got that drive, absolutely. You fall over, you pick yourself up, you go again. You might fall over again, you pick yourself up, you go again. Some entrepreneurs keep on falling over and never actually become successful, but you've got that drive built in with you. And as Franklin would say there, by preparing to 
by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. So we need to ensure that through the education that we provide in, in business education and create the future leaders, that we are not failing to prepare you. We're not preparing you to fail. We want you to be successful. And to be successful, you need to understand leadership. You need to have that built into your inner self and you need to be genuine and have integrity through your leadership styles. Next slide, please. If you could click again for me, please. So we have a challenge, absolutely, that we're preparing students with jobs that don't exist in the future. So what do we do? What's our approach as a leader within higher education to prepare you for jobs that don't exist? One approach could be we teach you accountancy, we teach you law, we teach you the nuts and bolts of what needs to be done to become an effective accountant, to become an effective lawyer, to become an effective engineer. But within two years, five years, that's going to be out of date. Much better, I would suggest, is that we educate you with the skill set that helps you be prepared for that changing, dynamic, agile workplace. And as much as you might not think it's important, understanding how to apply theory to practice and how to apply practice back into reinvent theory is critical. You need to understand it. Understanding the macro picture of the theory and seeing how it applies into practice and seeing how practice reinforms theory will help you understand the environment in which you're operating within. And it will help you make sense of that disruptive innovation and change. You need to be analytical, questioning, critical, creative. Those skill sets are also things that we as leaders within higher education need to get you to, to learn about, to become. We can teach you about, you need to understand analytical skills, or you need to understand how to be creative, but you need to internalize them. You need to be deeply analytical. You need to be deeply creative because only a creative analytical mindset will make sense of that disruptive innovation, change, the loss of jobs, the being able to forward think about what could be in the future. We need you to be articulate. Can you bring people on board? Can you explain in simple words to people really complex problems to help them understand what needs to be done? So they follow you as a leader to make the change that's necessary. And almost, or most importantly, I think you need to be critical thinkers. And we use this word glibly in higher education. We want you to be analytical and critical thinkers. What does it actually mean? Well, critical thinkers are people who don't just accept status quo. Why are we doing it that way? Is it because it's more efficient? Fine. Is it because it has a social justice agenda? Brilliant. Does it relate to some of the big climate change issues around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Absolutely. And how do we create change? How can we be critical of the objectives that we have within an organization and try to nudge people to work in a way which is a benefit to our organization. We, we need to think differently. And it, it's easy to say, but people who are critical thinkers don't just accept the status quo, want to be a little bit agitators within the organization to, to stop us thinking that, well, we've done it that way for the last two or five or 10 years, so therefore we continue doing it that way. Well, that's not always the, the case. We need to think differently in this changed world in which we're operating within. The global supply chain crisis is creating all sorts of problems. You know, I'm not sure if it's the same within India, but they're talking about we might not have enough food for Christmas. We might not have enough presents on the, the shelves for the supermarkets for Christmas. Let's think differently. When I, were, when I was a lad way back when, my parents used to make things. Whose parents they make things? We go down to the shops and we buy things. But, you know, maybe we can create, think differently about doing, if the shops don't sell the things that we want, perhaps we can go back to using these things, our hands, using our head, and being a bit more creative rather than just consuming and buying a box off the shelf. So it's our responsibility as leaders in whichever environment we operate within, whether it's in higher education, or it's a profit organisation, or a service organisation, is to ensure we bring people with us that can be effective leaders, to be genuinely 
in, and have integrity, empathetic, um, and to become a leader, knowledgeable about the challenges. And for us as business educators, I think it's our responsibility to ensure that students of the future have these key skill sets, that they become employable students, employable leaders, be it on executive education, you become what we teach you and you become an effective leader an effective manager for the future. Next slide, please. Thank you. I hope that was interesting, thought provoking and gives you some things to take away um, from today's session. So thank you. It's been an honour presenting, presenting today's um, keynote and I really do look forward to seeing everybody in person when the opportunity arises. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Martin, thank you so very much. It was actually wonderful listening to you. And I can see there are some questions for you, but before that, I really appreciate what you said. So leadership is not taught or caught. So I just want to listen to you uh, more about it before I start the official uh, questions, which are there in the chat box. At least one or two students have asked. Very, very impressive, very nice, and especially the second part where you said robots cannot be a replacement for men. What do you say? That's absolutely right. I think you know our challenge for society is to use the the benefits of artificial intelligence and machine learning to to help our race, a globalized um, footprint, and what we want to do. If and I think we need to reflect on. You can look at. Um, you can look at films, be it, um, be it The Terminator or other films that you look at where machines are taking over the world. I don't think any of us want to live in that world. Um, and as James Burke was saying there, the most complex machine we have in the universe is this thing here. And, and if, if scientists want to replicate this so that machines become intelligent thinkers, then we've got to really understand the ramifications of that because if a machine can become an intelligent thinker a machine will think much more quickly than you and i can do how many meetings have we ever been in where we've we've talked we've debated an hour has gone past and we haven't come to a decision a machine will do that in a blink of an eye and come with a decision and implement it in a nanosecond uh, and that pace of change will just be all consuming. And, and then we will be a society, as James Burke said, as I wrote it down, what will we do if there is nothing to do? And, and that's, that is a major worry for all of us. So of all the um, fantastic scientists that are out there listening um, to this keynote today, please don't create an intelligence, artificial intelligence, because it is be really dangerous for all of us. Absolutely right, you are, Martin. I was actually going through a WhatsApp message where, I mean, similar kind of uh, uh, emotions were displayed. He wrote, when TV came to my house, I forgot how to read books. When the car came to my doorstep, I forgot how to walk. When I got the mobile in my hand, I forgot how to write letters and so on. So uh, I think this is what disruptive technology is, you rightly said. But one thing is for sure, uh, Still, we are, we as in the teachers, the educationists, uh, it's not going to happen for sure. Machines cannot be replaced by men or vice versa. So both, I mean, both are uh, different entities and they will remain different. Uh, pandemic has taught us not for many things to the block. And uh, I, I just want to see, I mean, what the next one year is going to show to us. You know, I was discussing in a forum a few days back uh, as per the McKinsey report, 23 crore people in India only are affected because of the education in because of pandemic, right? And the worldwide scenario is same. But you just see this is because of positivity of the educationists that we could save this year. You know, we haven't allowed universities to go silent eye. We haven't allowed universities to go for a zero year. The school education system, the more it was more difficult. You know. To manage uh, senior students was still uh, quite better, but to manage youngsters, KG students, primary school students was a uphill task. And you know, uh, because of these, 
circumstances i feel that they have grown earlier in their age i i i see some some students some youngsters as old as 6 years 7 years 8 years now they are very well versed with the computer system they are taking classes online so this is basically a plus side of pandemic also but i say the credit goes to the education system the educators because we are the best learners and how we transform ourselves i think this is the key then one one good question was there dr nukuma if you can just see to it in the question on the session yes i saw sir uh, no uh, sir um, we have you know all the students are so enthralled with the professor broads Uh, presentation. I am inundated with no, no, questions. No, kindly, kindly correct yourself, Doctor Nupama. Not the students only. I also ask the question. So <laughs> yes, all so, present here. Yeah. All so present. I, my mobile is absolutely crashing with the questions. So if you allow me, I'll ask a couple of questions and then. Yeah, I'll, because I'll, just see the time schedule also. But since he has given us some time to ask the question, and first of all, I am really thankful, Doctor uh, Broad, uh, that. you actually allowed us to keep your lecture which is basically for our global leadership research conference to be stated in the month of february uh, along with this another uh, another big research competition case study competition then boy this is the 17th version and it was a coincidence that like when you when you uh, confirmed your date we later on found that this is a date where our inauguration of uh, then boy is also there and you kindly agree so basically you have added value to now both the conferences we are highly grateful so at least one or two questions dr anupama you can ask this but you uh, without affecting the schedule of uh, so uh, i'm told that we are there till 3:15 uh, so i have 5 uh, minutes and if yeah, i be please. allowed to ask questions okay uh, professor broad uh, one of the most uh, you know repeating question that's coming to me is what values are more important or most important for you as a leader For me, it's um, it is very much about integrity. I um, okay. I want to be a believable leader. I think for me, because um, I've worked in an environment where I haven't understood the the direction of a leader, or understood the the logical decision making that my my boss, my line manager, has undertaken, and it just becomes confusing. It can, we're heading in a direction, and I don't understand. The environment is telling me that it's going to rain, and you're telling me to put on my summer clothes. It just, you know, it just doesn't make sense. But if if you say, well, if I look outside and I can see it's raining, let's go outside with the umbrella. I use analogies, but if we if we look at the external environment in which we're working within, and we can make sense of that external environment in a business context, we can internalize that. We can think strategically about what we want to do. And it makes sense. You have integrity. Then you will have people think, "Yeah, it's going to be." I understand the direction we're going. I understand why we're going in that direction. I understand that it's going to be difficult for some things we need to do, but the goal is achievable if we do these things. So I think for me, it's the integrity and and I use that that you know smelling smelling what it's like. Um, one of my professors that I worked with at Southampton and I, I saw him yesterday, Professor Sri Kandaya has. I spent enough time in India with him numerous times. He uses this bit of yeah, smell, smell, get a sense of what it's like. And I, I really do take that to heart. You need to understand, and you need to have integrity. That that belief that people say to you, I do follow what you're saying. It does have a logical route going through there, and I can see that you are genuinely um, trying to make a difference. A wonderful. Uh... Professor Broad, uh, one more question, which is repeating in my uh, set of questions, is that uh, if we've all been through this, uh, this uh, terrible pandemic year, and everybody's, uh, you know, motivation is because of that loss of human contact. I think everybody is dealing with uh, health issues, and so how do you keep your team motivated? I think that's one thing that will be on top of everybody's table these days. Yeah, a very poignant question. As you heard in my introduction, I started at this university in September last year, and I only saw physically some of my staff September this year. So I had a year of being a two-dimensional face um, to a lot of my staff, and only saw them in the three-dimensional space literally a year later. <clears throat> and keeping them on board with with seeing me, and I. It is really difficult. The, the things that I did, um, I spent the time for the first three or four months 
bringing people together in focus groups, um, having open forums for meetings, and we were developing our strategy. So we had lots of conversations around what we were wanting to do. Um, I was replaying back the environmental um, as I saw it, asking people to get engaged, to let me, let me hear from them what their concerns were, what was happening, and got people to get to be involved. Now, I think, I think it works better within an organisation where you have worked in the physical space and you've then had to go online. For students in the room this afternoon who have come into Amity University in year one, where it's been straight into an online learning environment, that is Absolutely. the toughest. That is the toughest environment possible because you don't experience the culture of knowing people. And, and here we are today, however many people we've got in the room, we're only having one conversation. If you were physically in a university or in a room, there'd be hundreds of conversations taking place. If we were in, a, in an actual conference, in a physical conference now, there'd be breakouts and networking taking place. So the challenge that I've had, very much um, I can empathise completely with that, the way I've tried to deal with that is to bring people together as often as I possibly could, talk about things which are important to us as a business school, as a faculty, and to get to know people in that two-dimensional space. And, and then I found it easier when I actually did physically get to meet people. Um, but I do appreciate the challenges and, and mental health have been a major problem for students and for staff across the globe. Oh, one last question because uh, I see Dr. Auja is coming with our next segment. Uh, one last question. And um, uh, Professor Broad, what is that one most difficult thing that you find or the most difficult part of being a leader of a team? Or maybe in this context or otherwise? The most difficult thing is trying to um, balance the, the different pools you have. So as a dean of a faculty, I obviously report to the university executive and I have my team of staff within my faculty. There is a pull um, between what the university executive wants to happen and how I can encourage my staff within my faculty to do things. And they're very busy teaching, researching, etc. And the most difficult job I have is trying to understand that tension and trying then to take the, the direction that the university wants me to have and impart that knowledge in a way that I bring people with me. It's always sometimes I have to plant little seeds of thought. So I might say, yeah, gosh, we have a student survey coming up in three months time. And I drop a little seed about some good things we're doing or some challenges. And I let that seed germinate for a couple of weeks. And then I'll come back to, oh, something I said a couple of weeks ago, you know, let's have a little bit more of a discussion about it. So you don't dump good news and bad news onto me. You plant little seeds, let those seeds germinate. As they start to grow, you start to harvest and you get people to think about it. And that helps you then bring on people within your team to, to co-create solutions rather than the dean says do something, member of staff has to do it. Let's drop the seeds in, let them germinate, let people think about how they can um, come to the, um, to the dean with suggestions, harvest those suggestions, they feel part of that journey and you get much better engagement then. Uh, I see uh, our dean also smiling. I think he faces a similar kind of challenges. All right. I so I think I'm everywhere, uh, Anupama. So I was actually <laughs> jokingly. So I was just about to tell you that don't ask some difficult questions because otherwise it will be applicable to me also. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Broad, we are starting with a center of uh, uh, research publication. So this is our next segment. So in case if you have two, three, four minutes, and if you can just stay with us. So the next segment is about this. Uh, I request you if you if you have few more minutes, but choice is all yours. Look on Thank you point. very much indeed. It has been a pleasure being with you today. I do have to go on the half past hour of your time. Um, so yeah. I'll be with you for a few more minutes, but I have a further meeting to go to. But a bit of pleasure yeah. and I look forward to seeing you all in person Thank shortly. You. Uh, I'll take a couple of more minutes. Uh, uh, Ritika, could you kindly just um, finish off the thanking uh, for the next uh, session that we have? And then yes, we will hand it over to Ajat Satru for the next segment. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing with us your immense knowledge. We are certain every member present over here has gained tremendously. 
We request the audience to join us tomorrow for another wonderful session of the Mega International Lecture Series by Mr. Richard McCracken, the Head and Director of the Case Centre, United Kingdom. Amity Business School will organize the 7th Global Leadership Research Conference on the theme Leading in the New Reality, Insight into Actions, which will be held on 16 to 18 February 2022. GLRC 2022 is a platform where management scholars, researchers, academicians and practitioners come together to share their experiences about their groundbreaking outcomes of the research across diverse management domains along with the subsequent contribution to the building of a theory in the field of management. We hope to see you all there. Now I request Ajaj Shatru to take over the proceedings. Thank you, Professor Broad.